me. So when I asked God for a talk to you this morning, all that came to mind was, let's talk about being brave. And uh, again, because I've talked about being brave before, and if any of you attended the women's retreat in June 2015, this message might sound familiar because it's basically the message I gave there. And, and uh, I really felt like God wanted me to go back and revisit this. With one change, because since then I've been trying to live that out with better success than others at times. And this week I needed to be reminded about why I want to be brave. And so often when I'm given the opportunity to speak here, I come and work with you through things that God is showing me and opening up in my life, and today is no different. And I thought about so many of you who are facing situations requiring bravery too. There's kids going back to school, you may be going to college or university, or you're going to new teachers, and some of you are um, done school and entering the workforce, and some of you are maybe you're retiring, and there's just so many things we're facing where we need to we need to be brave. And I'm really the last person in the world that should talk to you about being brave. I could never imagine trying to encourage others to be brave because I lived in fear for a very long time. But this is something that God has ever been so ever gently nudging me about, sometimes not so gently. If Kate was here, I would look at her because she's the not so gentle nudge. Um, <laughs> Two summers ago, I bought a book called Let's All Be Brave, and I had to order it from chapters, and it had to get delivered to me, and it was wonderful and exciting, because I'm sure you all have that when you get books in the mail, it's like Christmas. I opened it up, and I was so excited, I read a whole chapter of that book. Um, I have gone back and read it, but it was enough to get me thinking about being brave. And can you talk about bravery and courage, and not mention David and Goliath? And even if you haven't read the story in 1 Samuel 17, you probably know the gist because it is the ultimate tale of the underdog triumphing. Unless you read Malcolm Gladwell, then he'll tell you something different. Uh, it's the story of a young shepherd boy who went back and forth between the front lines of battle and tending what one of his older brothers called a scrawny flock of sheep. And the massive, almost 10 foot tall, as tradition goes, giant from the enemy army. Goliath taunting the Israelites who were too afraid to face the giant for 40 days. And Goliath took his stand, he made a speech, he called for someone to face him. And this is just an aside, but I, I think it's interesting, because I felt a little jolt when I read that Goliath had been taunting the army for 40 days. Numbers are often representative of things in Jewish interpretation, and some say that the number 40 represents preparation. And that whenever we read a 40 in the Bible, it signifies a time of being made ready or of testing. So it was kind of, I just found that interesting. And at 40 days, here appears David. He's on the battlefield with his crackers and cheese. He's sent by his father, and he has instructions to check in on his older brothers. And he sees Goliath calling for one to face him. And he notices that the others have yet to respond for 40 days. He's appalled at what he hears coming from the giant. And he tells King Saul, don't worry, I've got this. And though initially the king laughs David away, David persists and gives Saul his resume of sorts and says, I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it again to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. And Saul finally consents and says, All right, go ahead, and may the Lord be with you. And taking five smooth stones and his slingshot, the shepherd boy defeats the giant. Annie Downs writes that David, as a shepherd boy, fought a lion and a bear and rescued a sheep. He never killed the lion in preparation for the bear. He didn't kill the bear in preparation for Goliath. He just chose to be brave at every turn to do his job and protect the sheep. That's how I felt over the past year. Being brave became about choosing not to let my fear own me, and choosing not to let my character be defined by fear. And she also writes that as the challenges grew in scope, so did David's belief in the ways God had uniquely created him. And more importantly, so did David's belief in who God is, and in the reality that David had a role to play on this planet that would, that would require courage, just like me and just like you. And this has been courage to me over the past year, small steps where I chose to just be brave and just show up and do my job, to do what a sister does, do what an aunt does, do what a Jesus follower does, just show up and do what God is asking me to do, one small act at a time. 
And I'm not saying Brie Brie can't be a big showy act or a demonstration of extreme valor, but in my life, so far, being brave looks pretty small. And most of those times go unnoticed by everyone except me and except by God. My acts of bravery probably look like normal life to many people. This right here is an example. There have been times when I have been barely able to catch a breath on a Sunday morning when I had scheduled to speak. Maybe it's because I, there's one thing that God's asked me to say and I'm terrified to say it. And uh, there's just that one line and no one even notices. And it took more courage than I probably would like to admit to buy plane tickets this week. The first time I actually had them and I let it timed out. And you can re reset that thing a couple times. <laughs> and I let it expire the first time because I was afraid to accept the final accept of those tickets. But I did, I went back and I did it again. And it took a lot of courage for me one day this was probably a bigger thing, um, to say to God out loud something I had never even actually allowed myself to think, just five words, and say, God, I don't trust you. I remember how fragile I felt in that moment as I spoke those words out loud. We're not really allowed to be honest with God, right? So I, uh, I, I remember feeling so brave that I could tell him how I honestly felt. I thought in that moment I would break, but I didn't. Instead, that one act of bravery was the start of something wonderful. Just like how David's belief in who God is grew with each challenge, so my belief in God grew, who God is grew in that moment. And so my belief in the ways God has uniquely created me grew. God heard me and loved me, and that's mostly a story for another day. But that moment changed something in my relationship with God. And it started with me being brave enough to say it, even if at that time I didn't realize that I was being brave or what would come next. But bravery starts somewhere. David didn't actually know what would happen. Saul didn't know what would happen. And this time while reading about David and Goliath, I found myself thinking about Saul and what caused him to get into David. The stakes were incredibly high. Goliath had issued the ultimatum, choose one man to come down here and fight me. And if he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, then you will be our slaves. When David offered to go, Saul objected at first, but then he gives in kind of easy. You know, I was thinking 40 days isn't actually that long when the outcome could mean slavery for your entire people. And yet Paul says yes. It just seems like there was no good reason for it other than maybe Saul had already accepted defeat. Maybe it was an inevitable, let's get this over with. And we hear this story and because of our collective memories and the impact that this story has had on our culture, it's easy to forget that they did not know what was going to happen. David believed, rightly so, that our God cannot be defamed, cannot be defied, but we don't always know how that's going to be set to rights. And like so many others in the Bible that we hold up for their courage, because we know the end, we forget about the struggle. The courage it takes to face life challenge by challenge, just doing our jobs, just doing our best, just facing our fears, just leaning in when you want to lean out, just staying still when you want to move, and not knowing how it's all going to work out. But with each hurdle, every challenge, we grow closer to God. We learn more about who He is, we learn more about who we are in Him, and we learn more about what we can do and where we can walk with Jesus. And I deliberately chose the word walking because walking well, has been on my mind. But I also chose it because our faith shouldn't be static. We need to be moving in our faith. We need to be walking and active and growing and, and continually pushing forward. And I thought about Esther. And to be honest, I never really thought of Esther as brave. I know I should have, now thinking back on it. But I think, again, knowing the end of her story overshadowed her acts of bravery. And yet when I really think about it, her story is full of bravery. Right from the start, we often talk about her getting to compete to be queen. But to be plucked out of obscurity, in reality, they were forced. They, this was an involuntary. Op, this was an optional for these women. Um, she would have been. It would have been terrifying. And after their year of beauty treatments, the women got one night with the king, only to be confined to his second harem, where she would live the rest of her life, never going to the king again, unless he requested her by name. And it seems to me that there's an awful lot to give up there. Your family, your friends, your community, your own hopes and dreams for your future, your hopes for your own husband, a family of your own, and specifically for Esther, on top of all of that, she's instructed to hide her identity as a Jewish woman. Her name is changed from Hadassah to Esther. 
And very few of the things we use to identify ourselves would be left for Esther to define herself. And so right from the start, she was braver than I ever gave her credit for. Now, in her case, the king was enamored with her, so much so that he sets the royal crown on her head and he declares her the queen. He gives a banquet in her honor. And I won't go into all the details of her story, but the king is tricked into issuing an edict that will eradicate all the Jews. So Esther's uncle Mordecai comes to her and asks for her help, and he wants her to go to the king and beg for mercy and plead for her people. And she responds by reminding him that the king's the that the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die, unless the king holds out his scepter. And the king had not called for Esther to come to him for 30 days. Mordecai responds, don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all the other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. So Esther calls for a fast, and on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and enters the inner court of the palace just across from the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne, facing the entrance, and when he saw Queen Esther standing there in, in the inner court, he welcomed her and held out his, the gold scepter to her, and she approached and touched the end of the scepter. And there's again much more to this story. But in the end, Esther, Esther risking her life to appear before the king saves not only her life, but the lives of her people. David, I think, is, a, is an example of courage on a big scale, a major showy display of bravery. But Esther is a demonstration of bravery in the small things, using your season for such a time as this. And these are the things that resonate more with me than defeating a giant with a slingshot. A few weeks ago when I spoke, I shared with you the story of the woman at the well from John 4, you might recall it. I'll give you a bit of a recap. Um, Jesus had left the Judea countryside and went back to Galilee. And to get there, he had to pass through Samaria. He went into the Samaritan village that bordered on the field Jacob had given his son Joseph. And Joseph's well was still there. Jesus, worn out by the trip, sat down at the well. It was noon. And a woman, a Samaritan, came to draw water. And Jesus said, would you give me a drink of water? The Samaritan woman, taken aback, asked, How come you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? And you might recall that Jesus answered, If you knew the generos generosity of God and who I am, you would be asking me for a drink, and I would give you fresh living water. The woman said, Sir, you don't even have a bucket to draw with, and this well is deep, so how are you going to get this living water? And Jesus said, Everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again. Anyone who drinks the water I give will never thirst, not ever. The water I give will be an artesian spring within, gushing fountains of endless life. And the woman said, Sir, give me this water up so I won't ever get thirsty, won't ever have to come back to this well again. And I thought of this interaction through the lens of bravery a couple times. It's a story of God seeking, of Jesus working and moving, despite the walls that have been constructed by society, by the woman, by religion. From verse 16 on, we see Jesus begin the painstaking process of establishing a relationship with this woman. And in the process, he reveals himself, his identity as the Messiah, and he invites her to place her identity in him. And when the woman says in verse 25, I do know that the Messiah is coming, and when he arrives, we get the whole story, Jesus replies, I am he. You don't have to wait any longer or look any further. This woman had many reasons to fear and few reasons to be brave. She was first a woman. Women were and are vulnerable members of our society. She was a Samaritan, and the Jews and Samaritans despised each other. And it was noon at the well. This indicates to us, as we've been taught and heard before, that she was an outcast, even in her own community. Water gathering was a social, communal event. It didn't take place at noon on your own during the hottest part of the day. And yet here is our friend, the woman at the well, alone at noon getting water. And despite all of this, all these reasons not to interact with her, despite all her reasons not to interact with Jesus, he walks in and he offers relief and hope, living water and restoration. He brings down these barriers, not with brute force, but in a totally Jesus-like way by replacing what is broken with what is being made new. And this woman responds with courage. She talks to Jesus. Despite all the barriers, she engages in conversation deep conversation, theological conversation, conversation that would not have normally been allowed. 
She's brave, she allows herself to be changed, and she returns to her people and invites them to be changed and restored as well. Sometimes bravery comes from receiving, as in the case of this woman. She allowed barriers to be removed. She allowed uh, the walls of gender and ethnicity and social isolation to be brought down to receive the restoration that Jesus alone brings. And maybe the bravest part of her story comes next. It's the unwritten part. I think that's often the bravest part of our story too, the part we don't know yet. But she goes back. She goes back to her community where she's not nameless, where she's not storyless. And she lives there. And she lives out this new life she's been given. There's a verse in the Bible, Joshua 1, verse 9. I have it memorized in song with action. I could know I was going to be this guitar here. I thought I'd pretend I was going to play it for you, but that would be horrifying for everybody on many levels. <laughs> um, but it, we've been in Sunday school so many times, and I, uh, it's Joshua 1, verse 9. And in that verse, God says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And this verse is part of the Lord's charge to Joshua. After Moses had died, Joshua must now lead God's people across the Jordan River and into the Promised Land. And in chapter 1, verse 6, God tells him to be strong and courageous. In chapter 1, verse 7, he tells Joshua to be strong and very courageous. And in 1, verse 9, he commands him to be strong and courageous. When something's repeated in the scripture, it highlights its importance. And three times, in three voices, in three verses, one voice, but three verses we read, be strong and courageous. God means this, and he also makes it possible. Liz Curtis Haig wrote a blog about the verse, and she said that's the essence of this verse. Not that you can be strong and courageous if you try. Rather, you are strong and brave for one reason. God is with you. God is the one doing the heavy lifting. He is the muscle, the tendons, the sinew. The power and strength are his alone. He can command us to be strong and courageous because he is all of those things and more. But God never lets go. God never gives up. And when we come to the end of ourselves, God is just getting started. Maybe fear isn't the issue for some of us. For some of us, maybe fear isn't the greatest challenge. It could be the discouragement. The phrases like, I've already tried that, or nothing seems to work, or what difference does it make? We know those words. We've said them, thought them, repeated them. But God says, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Other translations have it, do not lose hope or lose faith. He doesn't want us to be dismayed or downhearted. And this is why. That one small word, for. <coughs> be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And as I was praying and writing and editing, message. My thoughts turn especially to those of you who are grieving right now. I can't fail to acknowledge that grief has come to reside in our midst over the past few years, but in particular this summer. And this week alone we've lost um, Vanessa's father passed away and in our very own family, our, our friend, dear friend Nan has passed away. And it's a difficult time. And I thought especially of, of you and when I was realizing that a message encouraging you to be brave might sound glib. But it's not that. I think watching you live out your life in grief and making your choices and going forward is something that inspires each of us, actually. I think of those loved ones, but also of our, the loss of our hopes and dreams, our plans and desires. We may never get to see the things that we thought we would someday, the things we took for granted that we would. And I just, I just wanted to say we see you. We see you grieving and living anyway. And it's inspirational. And we, we, um, we know God is with you, and we take that with us as we go forward. And it's not a, a glib thing to say, cheer up, old pal. You know, this is a thing where you are um, actually living at something very real and difficult. And it's, uh, and we need you. We need to see you doing that. And, we appreciate your bravery in that. I want to end here because while I want to encourage you to be brave, I want us to know that it isn't us or our abilities or for our benefit that we are brave. 
David, as he faces Goliath, doesn't recite the words of the little red engine, but instead he recalls that the God who rescued him from the bear and the lion could rescue him from the Philistine. And he says to Goliath, I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Esther facing death if the gold scepter is not extended to her was not brave because she willed herself to be brave, but because after fasting for three days, she enters the king's presence for just such a time as this. And the woman at the well, her bravery allowed her to meet with Jesus, to drink of the living water, to tell of the freedom and the restoration that Jesus brings. Joshua leading the people into the promised land. Earlier in chapter 1, verse 5, God says, I will not fail you or abandon you. And in case you're worried about that being an Old Testament promise, it's repeated in the New a few times. In John 14, 18, Jesus says, No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. For you and for me, courage comes from knowing the Lord our God will be with us wherever we go. You're made on purpose and for a purpose. And as we open up our lives, as we commit to living as a follower of Jesus, we're going to need to be brave. And that's going to look different for each of us. In Annie Dan's book, she talks about the blank space. She wrote this before Taylor Swift, too. <laughs> and it isn't, that, it isn't that blank space so often what we're faced with when we are brave and moving into something new. I know it has been for me, this gaping unknown, that blank space. So I want to, want to encourage you to be brave, knowing how different that is going to look for each of us. Knowing how brave we have already been. Knowing that God will be with us wherever we go. Knowing that whatever is torn down, it will be replaced by Jesus. Knowing that we can be strong and courageous because God is with us and for us. So let's leave here this morning and begin to exercise our bravery. Choose the hard thing. Choose the thing that scares you and challenges you. Choose the thing that you know God is asking you to do. Let's pray. God, I don't have a whole lot to ask of you this morning, other than that you will be drawn near to us. Be close. Be with us. God, I pray that we will know and know and know that you are for us and with us. God, give us bravery. Give us courage. Allow us to make small steps. Allow us to make big steps if you ask us to, but allow us to do the thing that scares us. Allow us to do the thing that you want us to do. Father, I know you have a purpose and plan for each of us. Allow us to give us the permission to follow after that, to seek you. And I thank you, God, that you are the muscle and the sinew and the tendons, and you are our power and our strength.